see you folks tonight and uh, a couple announcements just to mention uh, Camp Michael uh, will be starting up here soon they have a schedule on their website you can check it out they have some volunteer days and then it starts right in I know my children are all signed up and and ready to go and uh, where they're looking forward to it they've never done anything like that yet so far so um, definitely uh, make sure that's all uh, set uh, with the young people and uh, <clears throat> keep in mind some of the other upcoming things that are uh, going on as well. The uh, sign-up sheet for mowing this lawn in the parsonage has been available too if, uh, if you're able to sign up for that. But uh, um, I think that's it for tonight. Not a whole lot of announcements needed, so let's go to Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, we're thankful for this opportunity once again to gather as uh, believers in this building that you've provided for us. And Lord, as we study scripture and uh, we, we look at some of the intricacies of context and culture and history, and, and Lord, it's, it's an educational side, a theological side, but Father, God, always help us to remember to apply it to our hearts and lives. So, Father, as we uh, study this deep theology in a way it's deep in a way it's not deep but as we do that father help us to see applications to our everyday lives lord we think of some of the requests that have been mentioned we think of sean's dad uh getting that heart cath this week we think of pete waiting with the results of this test um, lord others that we've been talking about and praying about uh, uh, dennis and his work situation as he uh, uh deals with a lot of different personalities there at work, just give him guidance. And, and others, Lord, that um, have issues at their job, just uh, guide and direct and pr protect. And uh, Lord, just uh, bless us this week. Give us a, a great week where uh, we're, we're looking to you for our strength, uh, but we're also uh, looking for opportunities to share uh, our faith with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Five hundred sixty five, we thank thee. Five hundred sixty five.
77. My whole heart. Number 77. I'm seeing just the first two verses. Uh, Jordan Stormy Banks, 615. Would you stand as we sing?
on Sunday mornings I'll often look at the clock to make sure uh, I'm right on time or at least generally speaking close to getting us out of here by noon and I've been looking at it and it's like every time I look at it there's no way it's that time and and I just kind of ignore it and keep preaching and looking and and tonight I just glanced at it and uh, it, it was totally wrong again so I'm thinking it maybe it wasn't me maybe it's the clock that's messed up so uh, but anyway uh, we just John just tweaked it now and it's it's correct again but uh, We'll keep an eye on it if it gets off. And maybe one of you is playing tricks on me, changing the clock. I, I didn't think of that. It could be Sean. I wanted to get out here. I wanted to get out of church earlier, so he, he spun it forward 15 minutes. I wouldn't put it past that. Would, is that something you've done before? Tonight we're in Acts 2.38. <laughs> if you want to turn there and find it, you don't have to read it yet. We'll look at it in a minute. But um, if I use the term add on sale, would you know what I was talking about? Add on sale? Anybody want to take a stab at what I mean by that? And add, like if you go buy an electronic and they want to add on, what are they doing? Upselling. They want to add the two year warranty. Do you need this charger? Do you need this case for your phone? There's all these add-on sales. What about um, uh, an oil change place? They ever have add-on sales? What are they trying to add on? Windshield wipers. I, well, you know, I noticed that one of your wiper blades looks uh, slightly worn. Uh, we have a special today. Uh, what else? They'll check your fluids and. What, what about, they always pull out that air filter. Oh, look, look at the elf, it's terrible. You need it. You know, there's all these add-ons. What about a drive-thru? They ever have add-on sales at the drive-thru? Oh, yeah, there's always a special. Uh, they, one place, I forget what it is, they always ask me, do I want an apple pie? Do I want an apple pie? If I want an apple pie, I would have ordered it. I, I'm, let's go, right? You know, uh, there's always these add-on sales. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Well, when it comes to faith, theology, and salvation, we need to be very careful about add-ons. You know, we're going to start adding stuff to it or adding on stuff to it. And theologians many, many years ago realized this, uh, and they came up with something called the five solas. You ever heard of the five solas? As soon as I say them, you'll probably recognize them. How about this? Sola gratia means grace alone, right? Salvation is by grace alone. Sola fida, uh, faith alone. Sola uh, Christus, Christ alone. Uh, soli dio gloria, the glory of God alone. And sola scriptura, which means uh, scriptures alone and, and those are named uh, the five solas and and hundreds of years ago that's all in Latin uh, these theologians realized we got to be careful about adding on stuff I mean uh, the the Bible these five things especially stand on their own you know salvation and, and Christ and the scriptures they're they're alone all by themselves we don't have to add anything and, you know, we can take all of those, especially those five basic things by themselves, but we don't need to add anything onto them. However, some folks do. They try to add things. And one of the verses in particular that they uh, decide to add something to salvation is they use this uh, Acts 2.38. So hopefully you found that. Acts 2.38 then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, some of these folks, they read Acts 2.38 especially, and they add something to salvation. Uh, in particular, they add baptism. They say baptism is necessary for salvation. Actually, entire churches, uh, entire doctrinal systems base their teaching, 
that baptism is necessary for salvation on this one verse. Can you imagine basing an entire denomination, an entire theology, in fact, adjusting how you interpret many, many other verses throughout Scripture based upon this one verse? People read this verse and they say, baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, I personally think that is a dangerous position to take because it makes our salvation contingent. Contingent on a work, an act that we complete. Now, I know some of these folks that from these denominations would say, well, it's not an act like uh, I have to pay money to the church or I have to visit Jerusalem or it's not an act like I didn't kill anybody like like that type of an act. It's it's just get baptized. But still, when you think about it, isn't that a human work? I'm taking the initiative. I'm, you know, going in the water and, and letting somebody baptize me. It's it's still a human work. Uh, look down there in Acts 2.38 again. Now, as we've been studying how to study your Bible, uh, we've been saying over and over, context is very important. There's the scriptural context in, in the verses before and after. There's the greater uh, context of the New Testament, and in some cases, the greater context of the entire scriptures that we have to take into consideration. But there's more than just scriptural context, right? There's the historical context. So, uh, however, this passage kind of gives us both, the scriptural context and the historical context. This, Acts 2.38, is actually part of Peter's very first sermon. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Peter uh, is filled by the Holy Spirit just maybe a week or so after uh, Christ has ascended into heaven. This is... Uh, you know, 47 days or so after Christ was killed on the cross or after he came back to life. So just very early on as the church started, uh, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and Peter is empowered and inspired to go preach. I mean, that must have been a spectacular uh, sermon. He receives the Holy Spirit and goes out and preaches. And I would say as we read this passage, that is a very effective uh, sermon. We can see verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day about how many were saved? 3,000 people uh, saved in one day. I mean, very effective sermon. One of the other Phrases. Now I lost where this phrase is used. Maybe one of you can find it. It says that these people that Peter was preaching to were cut to the heart. With the word of God that Peter was preaching, with the message, they were cut to the heart. They were very much convicted. Uh, many of those people that were just a few weeks prior were shouting, crucify him, crucify him about Jesus, the, the true Messiah. They're now realizing because of Peter's powerful sermon that, whoa, whoa, we just, we killed the Messiah. All these people that were cut to the heart and convicted about their murder of Jesus, Peter tells them, Acts 2.38, what does he tell them to do? He says, repent and be baptized. And, and that's the, that's the context of the passage, uh, but uh, there are several possible ways to interpret uh, this passage. I found a, a scholarly article this afternoon. I, I read the book that I'm kind of using as my, my base, uh, but I started running across this scholarly article, and I'm sure you read some of those with your husband over the years. Those guys can get so detailed. He listed... Uh, seven interpretations of this verse and uh, goes through them all. He lists all these different scholars that subscribe to each interpretation and we start throwing out names and you'd recognize some of these people. Charles Ryrie is cited on there and Henry Ironside is cited on there and, and many, many others. 
uh, they actually say what their interpretation of this passage is. But if you want to read that article, I can give you the link. It, it's kind of boring, but if that's your thing, you can read it. However, I will summarize it in this way. Even though there's seven possible interpretations, there's only two basic ways to interpret the verse. Okay? Salvation is necessary, or baptism is necessary for salvation, or it's not. Okay? Still, uh, there's all this debate uh, about how to interpret the passage. And uh, to simplify it all, uh, Peter was talking to the people that killed Christ, and he was asking them to display their change of heart by turning from sin, which is what? Repentance. And turning to faith in Christ, which is signified publicly by baptism. So essentially in the, the, this verse, baptism isn't a necessary condition for salvation. According to the verse, baptism is a proof of our faith. Now we can look at other verses to support that. If you can do it quickly, flip over to Acts 20, 21. Acts 20, 21. This is testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So this verse later on in the book of Acts, once again, connects repentance and faith, okay? Uh, they, they go hand in hand. So back to Acts 2.38, Peter includes the command, be baptized, because that would be a powerful symbol of the sincerity of their repentance. Now, for the Jews, what would baptism mean? I'm sure you've heard this discussed over the years before especially in that day, going out, stepping out, publicly proclaiming, I am accepting Jesus Christ and being baptized. What would that mean for the Jewish people in those days? Any ideas? Turning their back on the faith that they grew up with, that they were really indoctrinated with. I mean, these people were excellent Bible teachers. The young people, especially the boys, would have massive parts of the Bible required for them to memorize. So they knew the Jewish commands. They knew that on Saturdays they, they had a length of rope and that's how far they could walk. They knew about the ceremonial hand washings. They knew about, you know, I can't spit on the ground because that's work and that's making mud. So it's, yes, it's turning their back on all of that. What else? For those Jewish people being baptized, what else would it mean? being ostracized from the synagogue, which would also, since their faith and religion was so intertwined with family, it would mean being disowned and ostracized by your own family, right? Uh, your, your parents would literally disown you. They'd kick you out. They could bring you in front of the synagogue the, and the leaders there at the local level. And remember that verse that uh, Jesus talks about if you're backhanded, slapped? That's what they would do when they kick you out of the synagogue. They would, it was a symbolic slap back of the hand. And you'd be removed not only from the religion, you would be removed from your immediate family. You'd be disowned. So for the Jewish people, uh, being baptized, going out publicly and being baptized and connecting yourself with faith in Jesus Christ would mean walking away from family, your heritage, possibly being disowned. Now, is that true still in some parts of the world today? Sure. In Muslim-controlled communities, in Hindu communities. I've heard of stories even like Myanmar or Burma that is uh, basically Muslim-controlled nowadays, that people are saved and entire mobs and crowds crowd around them and they're going to kill them. And the missionary had to come, it's just a powerful story, it's like this. The missionary had to come to the crowd, 
grab the guy and say, you're not killing this man and takes him back to the church. I mean, baptism definitely in some areas of the world and throughout history has been a really big deal. Even here in the States sometimes. I remember when my dad was saved in the early 90s and he grew up Catholic and he was baptized as a baby, right? Sprinkled. And uh, he was convicted to call his dad and say, hey, I accepted Christ, I was saved, and I'm going to be baptized. And his dad was like, what are you gonna do that for? You were already baptized once. Why do you need to get baptized again? So even here in the States, there's some stigma, right, connected to baptism. So it is a, a big deal, however, we know from the totality of scriptures that we are not saved by baptism. We're saved by faith alone, not by works, lest any man should boast, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we, we know those verses like the, hopefully like the back of our hands. Still, that doesn't stop some folks from making baptism a necessary condition for salvation. Now, in my opinion, to do that, divide, it sort of defies the faith alone verses. We've already mentioned Ephesians 2, 8, 9. How about some others? If you're quick, you can follow along with me. John 1, 12. And you may know it as soon as I say it, but as many as received him, to them gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Uh, definitely, belief is the, the central part of salvation there. Uh, Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. How about, uh, that's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Philippians uh, 3, 9, one more here to give you. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God is faith. So we know, uh, just that's just a sampling of verses that teach us that salvation is by faith uh, alone. Uh, we know uh, one of the other intricacies of Bible interpretation is the Bible doesn't contradict itself. I mean, that's just a basic uh, standpoint there to jump from. The Bible can't contradict itself. So all these verses tell us salvation is by faith, but there's this whole group of people that says, no, look, look, Acts 2.38 says baptism is part of salvation. I mean, that, that would mean the Bible is contradictory, right? Unless you write off some of those other verses somehow. I remember talking with a man that uh, is heavily involved in the Church of Christ. Now, if you've ever talked with anybody from that denomination, they believe baptism is essential, a uh, necessary part of salvation. You have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. And we were talking uh, quite at length about it. He was uh, rattling off verses, and I was trying to remember verses as well. And uh, <clears throat> Can you, anybody want to take a guess of what instance in scripture, what story, what example that I went to, to prove that baptism is not necessary for salvation? Anybody want to take a guess where I went? Oh, you got it. Everybody got it. Good job, guys. Uh, that's exactly where I went. Went to the thief on the cross and we had this discussion about the thief on the cross. I said, what did Jesus say? He said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I think there's a lot of theological significance to that verse. Uh, but in our discussion, it's huge that the thief never was baptized. They didn't take him off the cross, baptize him. I mean, I think there's some person that... that 
through the years has claimed. Well, remember that sponge that they dipped in to give Jesus uh, some of the hip hyssop or, or not hyssop or whatever that that concoction was. I don't know if that's the right word, but that that they did that to that guy and it baptized him. You know, people come up with odd things, but he wasn't baptized. So I thought that's it, right? That's the smoking gun. I, I've got him. I, I've proved my theological point. The debate's over. I was wrong. Obviously, they've thought of that objection. The folks there at the Church of Christ, that they've heard it before. And this is what the guy said. Well, that's Jesus. He's the Son of God. He can do whatever he wants and declare uh, that anyone is saved without baptism. Basically, that's his prerogative. Now, I kind of stopped arguing with the guy because I didn't want to... I didn't want to get angry, I didn't want to get him angry, but I, I think that's a fairly weak argument. You know, if we keep reading the entire book of Acts, we consistently see that forgiveness and salvation is connected to repentance and faith, which basically happen hand in hand. Uh, right, we could look at Acts three nineteen. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, right, it just they sort of go hand in hand. Uh, repentance and, and conversion. There, Acts ten forty three. Just trying to stay right here in the book of Acts. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him should receive remission of sin. There's nothing there about believing and being baptized. It's just talking about believing. Uh, a few more pages over, this is another really good smoking gun verse, in my opinion. Acts 13, 38 says, Therefore let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. To me, there's another really, really strong story or instance that proves baptism isn't necessary for salvation. The thief on the cross, I think, is an excellent, strong one. Uh, can you think of another one? It's in the book of Acts. We're not quite there yet. We're getting close. It's in Acts 16. As you're turning there, can you think about the instance? Well, that I don't. That, that was definitely faith. Yeah, that's a great story too. Faith was the necessity there. Those, those, his friends had to rip the roof off. It was all done by faith. The man got up and walked. It was all, it was all, everything was done by faith. There, there was no. There are some things like that where um, they weren't, they didn't necessarily accept Christ. Or, you know, like we do speak out and accept him. It was faith. Despite his actions. Yeah, prove their faith. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of that. I, I was thinking of Acts 16, find verse 30, if you're there yet. But thank you for speaking out, though, and trying to think. Um, Acts 16, 30, you, you're picking up that story yet? What's that instance? What do we call it? The Philippian jailer, right? He says, Acts 16, 30, very famous verse, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Terry knows it, right? That was one back in the 70s, that was one of the key verses when you were taught to share your faith, they took you to that story. I've heard lots of people from the generation or two older than me, that is the verse they go to, Acts 16 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What does Paul say? Well, repent and be baptized? No. 
right? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All we see is belief. Belief. That's all that's necessary for salvation. So whether you want to go to the instance of the thief on the cross, you want to go to the instance of the Philippian jailer, belief is necessary for salvation. The baptism is consistently throughout scripture identified as a symbol. It's a testimony to illustrate genuine conversion. It's never a condition of conversion. Baptism is simply an act of obedience of following Christ, but it is not necessary to make it into heaven. Another great example, I keep taking into these sort of stories uh, to illustrate with different individuals, uh, flip back to Acts chapter 10. We sort of read some of the theology connected with that, uh, but kind of look at the context of this individual that is saved. There's this man named Cornelius who uh, sends for Peter and he wants to be saved. And when Cornelius is saved, Peter had witnessed to him uh, and had told him to believe and be saved. And he received the gift of the indwelling spirit, which indicated this, that his salvation was indeed genuine. Now, look at Acts 10, 47. Um, start in verse 46, actually. They heard them speaking in tongues, magnifying God, indicating that, yes, indeed, he had been indwelt by the spirit. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized to have received the Holy Spirit just as we had? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So what's the theological significance of that verse? Well, the moment you're saved, you receive the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, right? Christ comes to live in you. The Holy Spirit didn't come after they were baptized. Baptism was after the salvation experience. Okay, they're not one and the same. So another very important theological instance and in verses to, to prove the point that baptism is not the means of salvation. It is the symbol of salvation. First uh, Peter, if I can find it, First Peter 3.21 talks about this there is also an anti-type which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Christ Jesus so it's just a, a, a sort of a, an example of salvation and we can't be we have to be aware of that and, and if you run into one of these folks uh, you can just go back to that that concept of add-on you know, you, you don't need to add on baptism to salvation. You don't need to add on some work. Uh, all that's needed for salvation is faith. That's all that's needed. We're saved by grace through faith. And uh, we don't have to add on Old Testament law or, or some other work. So that's that verse. Uh, uh, I'm sure you believe that and understood that. It's not any earth shattering thing. Uh, maybe that helps you in your discussion. Has anybody ever... Has anybody ever entered into a discussion with somebody that believed baptism was necessary for salvation? Anybody? A couple heads shaking. I actually, one of my coworkers is, is when you're riding around in a van and you start talking about all kinds of things when you're stuck with them for hours. And then a, a really good friend of mine from high school, his wife was from the Church of Christ. And we got into some theological discussions with her. Uh, so I've had a few in my life. Any, anything you thought of as I was talking tonight that you want to say? Any comments, questions? Gary? It's kind of interesting. Um, my dad was a Baptist pastor. Yeah. And he had a brother that became a Christian. Uh, he mentioned it so long ago. Church of Christ. Oh, Church of Christ, yeah. And, um, he was my uh, dad's youngest brother, and so there was a, a challenge between the two of them, 
and uh, that he knew the scripture, the scripture well, and I think he was a lot younger and he was learning. And so there was some interesting conversation when we had the uh, family reunion. Oh, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so Carrie remembers her dad and her uncle. Yeah. having theological debates over this very subject because it's the defining point of their entire denomination they do have a couple small sub points but that's the big thing anybody else well you did great tonight <laughs> that's all I can say you did great uh, let's uh, sing our uh, closing song and uh, spend as much time chatting with friends or hanging out or uh, do whatever you got to do. Let's stand together and turn to 497. 497. <laughs> Thank you.